Hi everyone, and welcome to Uncovered Vintage Fashion Magazine Review. I'm Stephanie, and I've been collecting and selling vintage fashion magazines for over 20 years. And I'm Morley. I'm a former copywriter, and am now an award-winning playwright and screenwriter. Together, we will examine some of your favorite vintage fashion magazines from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. On Uncovered, we'll discuss some of the magazine's models, layouts, and did I mention the models? And we'll also review some of the ads and articles that make these magazines such a great piece of pop culture history. So, fashion your seatbelts and let's get uncovered! Hey everyone! So here we are, episode number 7 of Uncovered Vintage Fashion Magazine Review Podcast. So Steph, which magazine are we going to review today? I'm glad you asked, Morley. Today we're going to be reviewing Glamour Magazine, June 1996. Okay, so do you remember anything about 1996? 1996, I was working my first job, six years into working my very first full-time job. And you're still there to this day. And what about you? In 1996, I remember I was into my second year of working for a new company. It was a really good company. And uh, that's all I really remember. But I can also tell you what was going on in the world at that time. So, for example, the Unabomber... Theodore Kaczynski, was indicted on 10 criminal counts. Remember the Unabomber? Scary stuff. Very scary. Yes. I remember as well, Nintendo 64 went on sale in Japan. I remember I got the Nintendo 64. It was really a, a game breaker, no pun intended, <laughs> because it, uh, it really, the graphics were phenomenal. Let's talk about some other things that were going on as well. In terms of movies, uh, The Cable Guy with Jim Carrey was released. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. I have. Have you? I did. It was a really good movie. It was kind of groundbreaking for Jim Carrey because it was kind of like a dark comedy. And people were used to seeing Jim Carrey in movies like Ace Ventura, The Mask. So this was kind of a different turn for him. And we later see more film roles like that, like The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind or something like that. Really good movie. Um, Independence Day opens. What I remember about that movie is I have a friend, Josh. Will Smith, yeah. And I remember I, I with my friend Josh, and he said, look, you got to see this movie, Independence Day. I said, I don't know. It doesn't sound like my type of movie. He said, look, you're going to love it. And if you don't, then we'll see the movie you want to see next time. Did you love it? No, not at all. So I, <laughs> I think I got to choose the next few. It was pretty disappointing. Speaking of disappointing, uh, The Nutty Professor opened with Eddie Murphy. I don't oh, know if he's... love that movie. Yeah, I didn't see that one. I really liked it. Yeah, I prefer the original one. Let's talk about some of the songs. So some of the uh, songs that were um, going on at that time was At the Crossroads by Bone Thugs and Harmony. I believe you had that album, right? No. Uh, Always Be My Baby, Mariah Carey. Oh, I definitely know that song. You better. Mariah, love you. And speaking of love, (laughs) uh, Because You Love Me by Celine Dion uh, was another big song at that time. Some of the books at that time were The Runaway Jury uh, by John Grisham. Now, I believe that was made into a movie. I don't know if it starred Julia Roberts or if I'm thinking of The Runaway Bride. Uh, A Crown of Swords by Robert Jordan. And The Tenth Insight by James Redfield. Now, have you ever heard of James Redfield? I have not. He wrote this amazing book. It kind of changed my life a little bit called The Celestine Prophecy. Oh, I remember that title. Great, great book. So that's what was going on at that time. And of course, maybe most importantly of all, Jay-Z released his debut album. So there you have it, folks. 1996, June. So I just wanted to share that one of the reasons we are doing this particular episode from 1996 is that we've received feedback from our listeners, one in particular on Instagram. I'm not going to mention any names. That they really enjoyed our last 90s episode. So thank you so much. And here's another one for you. We're going to be doing Glamour Magazine. Glamour I always thought of, and maybe I'm wrong, I always thought of as Glamour as sort of the working girl's Vogue. What does that mean exactly? Not as high-end as Vogue. Okay. But still some great articles, great advice, and nice fashion. Okay. That's a fair comparison. Yeah. And excellent designers and the top hair and makeup people, of course. So the same people who work on hair and makeup, let's say for Vogue or Cosmo, would also do it for Glamour? Oh, yeah. Okay. They would. Great. So Glamour was actually the first fashion magazine, and I didn't know this, to have an African-American woman on the cover. Hmm, that's and that was in 1968. And that issue became their best-selling issue. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Her name was, and I hope I'm not killing your name, Katiti Karand, okay? And she had applied to and won Glamour's Best Dressed College Woman contest. And she went on to model for Laura Ashley, TJ Maxx, 
She started her own clothing line and taught Harvard's first ever intro to fashion course, which is a course that I would personally love to take. Fantastic. So obviously she's got brains as well as beauty. But fast forward to 2019, just last year, and I didn't, I'm embarrassed to say that I did not know this either. Glamour magazine has actually ceased publication of their print magazine after 80 years. So they've gone ahead and switched to a digital only platform. The last issue apparently was January 2019. And according to the publisher of Glamour, which is Condé Nast, the magazine had a print circulation of about 2 million. Wow. But an online audience of 20 million. That's amazing. And how do you compete with that? So they shut down their print operation. Wow. Which I was a little bit surprised to hear. Yes, they've done that for a number of magazines. I believe they also used to own the magazine uh, Gourmet. Mm -hmm. I remember they stopped publishing Gourmet magazine. In other words, it's toast. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Morally. Go on. And the reason I wasn't aware that Glamour had actually stopped publication of their print magazine is because I'm not actually a reader of Glamour. Nothing against Glamour. It's a, it was a fantastic magazine. But I think of it as more for a younger, gen, a younger demographic. That makes sense. I understand. Yeah. It's like I, I wouldn't be reading necessarily Maxim magazine if it's still in publication. Maybe in my 20s. But now I wouldn't. Yeah. Makes total sense. So there you have it, folks, and let's get uncovered with Glamour Magazine, June 1996. Great. So on the cover, we have beautiful Rebecca Romaine. The photographer is Paul Lang, hair by Samal. I'm not sure how you say this name, C-E-M-A-L, makeup by Tracy Saunder, and the fashion is a yellow swimsuit by Manuel Canovas. And I'm going to go ahead and read the headlines. So this is a summer issue, and the headlines are as follows. Swimsuits 96, the top flatterers. Men and sex, what he will and won't do for you. Summer hair that behaves. Rocky love, went to jump ship. Health alert, 10 mistakes even smart women make. And men tell, the little ways we drive them crazy. So is this... Did men... you write that article, Morley? Well, I don't know. Is this the way that men drive women crazy or the way women drive men crazy? Women driving men crazy. Oh, God. That's only that's a whole issue in and of itself. <laughs> that's a whole book for you. Yeah, right? for sure. <laughs> so cover model Rebecca Romaine, she needs no introduction. She's an actress turned model from Berkeley, California, and she started her modeling career in 1991. She's appeared on the covers of Elle, Marie Claire, Cosmopolitan, Allure, Glamour, GQ, Esquire, Sports Illustrated, as well as countless ad campaigns. Her first major movie role was as Mystique in X-Men in 2000. Did you see X-Men? I saw the first one. Didn't see that one. Okay. She's also had numerous TV appearances. She's even recorded music, which wow. I wasn't aware. She was married to actor John Stamos. Remember that? Of course. That I remember, yeah. They did divorce, and she has been married to actor Jerry O'Connell since 2007, and they have twin daughters together. Yeah. So Jerry O'Connell... I remember him best probably as, and this was a long time ago, as Vern in Stand By Me. Yep. We saw that movie uh, at a friend's uh, outdoor little movie theater, if you will, yeah. in the backyard. Fantastic movie. Great actor. Uh, Rebecca, on this cover, she's shown on a beach. It's a beach scene. She's bent over, wearing a modest yellow one-piece swimsuit. Her wavy blonde hair is worn loose in waves. Natural-looking makeup. She's the picture of California girl beauty. She is the quintessential California girl. And that's Glamour Magazine, June 1996. Now, you know who she looks a little bit like from this particular pose and her smile and the cover? She reminds me a little bit of Drea DiMatteo from The Sopranos. Interesting comparison. You know, without the tattoos, of course. But she looks a lot like her. That's just my opinion. But it looks like a great magazine. And once again, I love how Glamour, the title, is in yellow to match her bikini. I think it's the exact same shade, is it not? Yeah, and that's, I'm sure that's intentional. It looks sure. fabulous. Now, what, what shade of yellow would you call that one? Uh, banana yellow? <laughs> Probably not. Okay. I don't know. Okay, because you're always so fancy <laughs> with the colors, so I wasn't sure. I don't know. Okay, great. So I want to draw everyone's attention to pages five and six. It's a double page spread. It's for Sears. And on the left-hand side, there's simply a, a picture of a, a small, maybe propane barbecue, I'm not sure. And it says, I went in for a grill. That's it. Just, I went in for a grill. And on the other side is a huge picture of this model wearing a bathing suit. And the line there says, and left with something else that sizzled. How brilliant. 
So on the left hand side, it says I went in for a grill. And on the other side, and left with something else that sizzled. What does that tell you about this ad, Steph? Maybe you can describe the photo a little bit. Sure. So again, it's simply a small picture. It's almost entirely uh, a white page with a small picture of a barbecue grill, like a, a barbecue. And this above the barbecue is that line, I went in for a grill. And on the other side, a huge, beautiful page of this model with a bathing suit, uh, one-piece bathing suit. And the background looks like a pool. And... Um, I think it's just brilliant. And then on, on the bottom right of the page, it says, come see the softer side of Sears. So what is it trying to tell you? So when you think of what this uh, ad is really about, on the left-hand side, they're showing, I went in for a grill. And I guess um, the Sears clientele at the time were probably mostly male. Yeah, I think Sears, and... generally speaking at the time... Uh, was recognized as a store where you bought your washer and dryer and car parts, or yeah. appliances, or a barbecue. And they're trying to appeal to the female demographic. So come see the softer side of Sears with a beautiful model saying, and I left with something else that sizzled. So that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to appeal to women. What's also nice as well is that not only are they showing that, they're actually advertising the price for the uh, for the bathing suit. Oh, very smart. And the bathing suit is how much, stuff? Can you read that? Oh, gosh. $38? $30, $38, $39. Very clever. So on the one page you have, it's basically aimed towards men. And the right-hand side, probably aimed towards women or possibly for men who are looking to buy a gift for their ladies. Yeah. I thought it was a very, very clever ad. What they're saying is this just isn't, this isn't just your husband's store. That's right. Perfect. Yeah. So really great ad. Whoever wrote it, I very hope this effective. ad... Yes, I hope this ad won some awards. So now we come to page 162, and the title is Swimsuits 96. It's an eight-page layout, and it's captioned 39 styles to flatter you this summer. This summer's satisfying fusion of fashion and flattery is as refreshing as a dip on a 90-degree day. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> I don't think that I can. And not to worry, we're not going to be going through all 39 styles of swimsuits. Aww. I know, I know. But just so some of the credits are as such. The model is Leticia Casta, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly. The photography is by Alex Chatelain, hair by Maury Hobson, makeup by Vincent Longo, and the location is Pink Sands Beach, Bahamas. Now, this being a June summer issue, much of the magazine is photographed on this beach. It's called Pink Sands Beach. Well, that worked out well. It did. So just as an FYI, the color of the sand is very unique on this particular beach. It's pink, and that's due to crushed shells. So here's a little bit of trivia. Do you know how, generally speaking, sand is generated? So parrotfish actually will eat coral. And what they do is they will excrete the coral. Gross. And I know. Oh. And so they're obviously eating pink coral, and that's how you get a lot of the sand. I never, I mean, never walk on a beach again. Okay. That's okay with me. Okay. So um, here we have the French model, Leticia Casta. She is no stranger to swimsuits. She's well known for her curvaceous figure. Now, Casta grew up in Normandy, and she was discovered at age 15 while lying on a beach with her family. So very appropriate. She's modeled for several Sports Illustrated issues, as well as for Victoria's Secret. And magazines such as Elle, Mad Mademoiselle, Seventeen, Cosmopolitan, and Glamour. She was a guest girl in 1993, along with Drew Barrymore and Anna Nicole Smith that same year. Esteemed company, indeed. Very. And the focus of this layout is finding swimsuits that flatter your figure. Probably any swimsuit would flatter hers. Just saying. Vincent Longo has done the makeup in natural tones. Maury Hobson's hair is done in beachy waves, both loose and worn up or under a hat. The swimsuits are modest. They're not overly revealing. They're both printed and monochromatic. They've used light colors in this layout as well as bright and even black. So there's something for everyone. And the model, uh, Leticia Casta, is shown in various poses, reclining and standing. But I noticed that Alex Shadlin had only shown her from the thighs up, which I thought was interesting. But I would presume that that's to focus on the swimsuits. Definitely, for He's sure. He's done a great job. In fact, story staff, if you take a look at the ad itself, or the layout, I should say, it looks like the swimsuit is perfectly proportioned and, and positioned. So that's what really stands out. Yeah. So I think whoever photographed it did a great job. Oh, well, he's a very, very well-known photographer. Right. Very highly esteemed. Let's see why. So the designers in this layout include Calvin Klein, Malia Mills, Kangol, 
Wheat by M.A. Rabinowitz, Shan, Ann Cole, and others. So all in all, a beautiful looking layout. Lots of swimsuits, something for everyone. Not too skimpy, good coverage. And she's the model throughout the uh, layout? She is the model throughout, and she's very prominent in this issue. Because what I notice as well as we're looking through the pages, her hair seems to be different in all the other uh, pictures. I, I couldn't even tell it was the same person. So once again, whoever did the hair... Maury Hobson. Yeah, I mean, did a fantastic Hair job. Hairstylist extraordinaire. Clearly. Uh, because, again, she seems to have different looks and uh, different moods. A uh, great job. Excellent layout. What I want to focus on now is another double page ad. It's on pages eight to nine. So when you open it up, normally what advertisers want you to do is they want you to look from left to right because that's how we read in English, left to right. However, in this case, when you open up the page, your eye immediately goes to the next page, which is, in fact, page 9. And, Steph, can you read what it says? To get to Plymouth, hop on a mouse. And there's actually a picture of a mouse for a keyboard. And what they're trying to say on page 8 is, basically, if you want to look for a new car, take your mouse and go to a website, which in this case, I believe, is PlymouthCars.com. Don't bother trying to look it up because it no longer exists. I took a look. So they're trying to essentially tell you to look for Plymouth cars. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Plymouth, you may recall in the 80s, they came up with those talking cars, the Plymouth K cars. Your door is ajar. Things like oh, that. Oh, was that them? That was them. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Um, our friend Iris, I remember her, her family got one. And I was shocked. We were driving somewhere she drove. And all of a sudden, it said that your door is ajar or it gave me some instructions. I thought, wow, that was amazing. You know, this is back in the late 80s, I think it was. So that's what they were really known for. But the ad is basically trying to get you to go to the website to pick out a car and how easy it's a one-stop shop basically to go online. Now, remember, this is 1996. This is very new technology for 96. It really is. I mean, I got my first computer again in 1998. So here's a question for you. Do you have any idea why, when computers first came out, they would come preloaded with games. Free games, by the way. Any idea why? Is that a question for me or for our lovely audience? Well, since they can't answer me, I'll ask you. <laughs> no, <laughs> no okay. I don't. I don't. Okay. So. But if anyone out there has any idea why computers be- were preloaded with games in the 90s, please feel free to email us. Actually, don't bother because I'm going to give you the answer. Okay. It was a rhetorical yeah. question. I just wanted to see if you knew. You clearly don't. The answer would be no. I don't know morally. So here's the answer why. So you'll notice now that most computers do not come preloaded with games. The reason that they used to come preloaded with games back then is because Microsoft, who was the primary maker uh, of those computers and the software, I should say, they came up with Windows. And in order to use Windows, you needed a mouse. So remember the early games. There was Solitaire. There was um, uh, mine, I can't recall what it was called, where you had to click on these buttons to uh, get rid of the mines. And they had all these other games. The purpose was to teach you how to use a mouse. Because most people did not know how to use a mouse. Prior to Windows, there was no such thing. You have to use your keyboard to get to anywhere. But with Windows, now you're required to use a mouse. What's the best way to teach someone how to do something? Make it fun. So that's why computers came preloaded with games, so you would use the mouse. And that's how people learn how to use it. So with this ad, again, it was 1996, two years before I got my first computer, probably around seven years after I started using a very first computer at work. But it was very cool. And the fact that they had a website back then where you could actually, you probably couldn't pay for things. I don't think they had online shopping like that. Certainly not for cars. But it was a great way to click on the uh, click on the website, Choose the one that you wanted and then go into the dealership or call them up at their 1-800-PLYMOUTH number and say, this is the model that I want. Very cool. So I think the message here is pretty clear. And even the caption, one clever idea after another, that's Plymouth. What they're saying is, we're technologically advanced. Right. Now, too bad they weren't advanced in other areas because they no longer make Plymouths, at least not in North America to my knowledge. So, But a great ad and uh, certainly ahead of their time. So on page 180... We have a layout, and it's entitled Evening Exposure, and it's a six-page layout. And I will read you the caption. Summer evenings, day melts slowly into night, the sun lingers and the heat holds. 
This is a time of year when dressing for evening doesn't necessarily mean dressing up. All that's required are simple styles with a special touch. The best way to ease into evening, lots of lace, languid knits, and featherweight fabrics with unexpected textures to draw the eye. But why are they shouting? Because all in capital letters. Oh, it's letters. all in caps. Look at that. <laughs> so it's so strange. It's like, summer evenings, day melts, slowly into... It's like, why are you yelling? I can so see... okay. this is the 90s, and I don't think they realized that they were yelling yet. Okay. But, like, stop yelling. Exactly. So the model, she's unknown to me. She's beautiful, blonde, long hair. Photography by Alex Chatelain. So this is the dream team, again, consistent in this issue. Hair by Maury Hobson. Makeup, Vincent Longo. And again, the location is Pink Sands Harbor, Island, Bahamas. So what this is, it's evening wear with a focus on bare skin, torso, arms, or ankles. Suggestive, but giving nothing away. Skirts and dresses are worn long. Black is clearly in style, even though this is a summer layout. Right. Lace and semi-sheer fabrics are also in style. And the caption actually credits Madonna, and I'll read you the following quote. Madonna may have put lace on the map with her lingerie looks, but you know that the true magic of lace is its sheer beauty, not shock value. So, Morley, is it me or is that a bit of a backhanded compliment to Madonna? It's more than a backhanded compliment. <laughs> I think it's a full a little, compliment. A little, it's a little catty, No. Yeah, I think so. Don't you think? Yeah. Now, just so everyone knows in our audience, by this time, Madonna was pregnant and about to give birth to her first child. Lourdes, I guess. Yes. And later on in the year, Evita came out, which we, she was highly acclaimed for. So she was no longer in the lacy uh, part of her right. career. Right. She had sort of moved on. She more matured. Yes. Got it. So the point of that... Quote being that lace is to be worn, but worn conservatively, not giving away the store, so to right, speak. Right, right. Designers featured in this layout include Parallel, DKNY, J. Crew, Vivian Tam, Daryl K., Alberto Biani, Omo Norma Kamali, Trip New York City, Only Hearts, Jill Stewart, and Christian Louboutin. And he's the one famous for the shoes, right? He is. Okay. So the model's blonde hair, as I said earlier, is worn long and loose or tied back in a ponytail. The hair is engineered by legendary stylist Maury Hobson. I'm sorry. Did you just use hair and engineered in the same sentence? I did. So does that mean that Maury had to go to engineering school to learn how to do the hair? It's possible. So how do you engineer hair? Any idea? I'm just curious. I really don't know. Do you think that you would be able to cut hair? I certainly know that I don't know how to engineer here. I've just never heard that term before. Engineer here. Okay. It's an art. It's a skill. Well, there you go. It clearly and is. And I don't ever want you cutting my hair. Okay. But thank you anyway. All right. So I wasn't offering, but okay. <laughs> so the makeup is subtle. Emphasis on the eyes and a pinky nude lip by Vincent Longo. So let's just talk a little bit about Vincent Longo, this fabulous celebrity makeup artist. Longo's originally from Australia. He's Italian-Australian. He moved with his parents to the Italian Riviera in his late teens, where he enrolled and excelled at the makeup studio of Milan, working with designers such as Giorgio Armani, Gianni Versace, Dolce & Gabbana, and Gianfranco Ferre. He moved to New York, where he worked for Vogue, Glamour, W, Marie Claire, Elle, Vanity Fair, and so many others, too many to mention. In addition, if that's not enough, he was contributing editor, excuse me, contributing beauty editor at Elle magazine. So Longo's also worked as a spokesperson, master makeup artist, and product consultant for Revlon, Estee Lauder, and Elizabeth Arden. Great. Right? So overachiever. Yeah. (laughs) Some of the famous faces that Vincent Longo has worked on are supermodels Cindy Crawford, Christy Turlington, Linda Evangelista, and Naomi Campbell. The list just goes on and on. So apparently, Vincent Longo could never find the right shade of foundation to match the model's varying skin tones. So he would mix the exact shade for each model in his kitchen. Wow. And this led to his creating his own makeup line. Hmm. Now, the only thing I make in a kitchen is a mess. That is And I'm sure you can attest to that. Absolutely. Yes. Longo's work in this magazine is typical of the perfection that we've come to expect from him. And on that note, we move on to our next topic. The last thing I wanted to talk about was this wonderful one-page ad. Yes, it's one page for a change. It's on page 129, and it's for Di Sorono. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Di Sorono, it is, I guess, an amaretto liqueur. And usually you add it with things, so it's a mixer. 
I believe. And the ad on top, the, the writing says, Di Sorono starts with a D. And underneath you have this wonderful picture of uh, a couple. Looks like they're having a wonderful time drinking. They're, they're outdoors. And she's about to say something or she's laughing. And underneath it says, and ends with an O. So Di Sorono starts with a D. And ends with an O. Oh. Very clever. Very clever. It reminds me of an old joke of mine prior to getting married where I'd say, uh, too many X's and not enough O's. Very similar. <laughs> so I thought the ad itself was very clever, very simple, but but very clever. So again, I really enjoy wordplay and I love the simplicity of the ad. And it's a little risque. A little risque because ends with an O doesn't mean it's the big O or does it mean that it's so... Uh, this one, this particular one, I believe, is a sour one. So maybe it re- refers to how, how sour it is. I'm not sure. But either way, very clever, but very simple. Definitely grabs your attention. And I love the ads that don't fill up all the white space. Sometimes less is more, especially when it comes to advertising. So the next layout that we have here is one that's close to my heart. It's on page 194, and it's called Hair That Behaves. Even in summer. Oh, behave, Stephanie. (laughs) And the caption reads, Summer is not kind to hair. Curls swell into a mess of frizz. Straight hair goes limp and and clings to your head. Because we're approaching the most hair-challenging season, we asked top stylists Orlando Pita and John Frieda, the creator of Frizz Ease, for their most weatherproof coping strategies. Consider these time-tested styling techniques for making your hair do what you want it to do. So I can okay. do the dishes, maybe do some vacuuming. That would be ideal. Perfect. Um, so this is a six-page hair story. And the models' names are Diane and Jolene. Photography by Philip Newton. Hair, as I said, by Orlando Pita and John Frieda. And makeup by Tracy Sondern. So basically what this is, it's advice from two top hairstylists. I'm sure you, that most people have heard of these two. Orlando Pita, John Frieda to show how to manage different hair textures in the summer. They should have opened up a law firm. They could have called it Pita and Frida. Oh, my goodness. Let's go. <laughs> Model Diane has curly hair. Jolene has straight hair. And throughout this layout, they try different strategies and succeed in straightening curly hair, curling straight hair. They describe which products to use and how to style hair in waves, big curls, ringlets, and most notably... Go from frizzy to straight and shiny. This is something that I have personally never been able to do in humidity. Kudos to them. So many times on vacation, as you know, Morley, I've brought my straightening iron. And then I just live in a ponytail for a week. Well, maybe if you'd start using frizzies, then maybe you wouldn't have that problem anymore. Perhaps, but I've sort of given up on that. Orlando Pita is one of the most accomplished hairdressers in the industry. Some of his famous heads include Lady Gaga, Natalie Portman, Janet Jackson, Demi Moore, Drew Barrymore, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Madonna. The list goes on and so, on. So up-and-comers is what you're saying. Yeah, nobody established there. Exactly. So British hairdresser John Frieda has counted Diana Ross, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, and Lady Diana as some of his celebrity clients. And he's a mastermind, as I mentioned, behind Frizzies, which they're frizz-defying hair care products. Is that still around, do you know? Yes, it is. Great. And as a point of interest to you, Morley, he's actually married to the singer Lulu. I believe she's a 60s singer. She's a very famous 60s singer. Some of you may recall her from To Sir With Love, is I believe a number one hit in the 60s, and from the James Bond film. So makeup artist Tracy Saunders, she's done very subtle makeup in neutral tones, no bright colors. In my personal opinion, I believe this is in contrast to what they were showing in the 70s and 80s. It's a very uh, neutral, natural look. The models look lovely. They're wearing light clothing and swimsuits. Designers include Naf Naf, Michael Kors, DKNY, Michael Stars, Malia Mills, Banana Republic, and Keiko. But to me, the message in this particular layout, the message that I get from it is love what you have. It's a lot of work to, unless you're a hairdresser, it's a lot of work to make curly hair straight, straight hair curly. If you can get to a place where you love what you were born with, That's the ultimate. And if you don't, then use frizzies. Exactly. So I think that brings us to the end of Glamour Magazine, June 1996. Wonderful issue. I would encourage anyone to have a look at it if you have an opportunity. 
It's available in my eBay and Etsy stores. Seller name is Great Mags. That's G-R number eight M-A-G-Z. And of course, if you have any questions or comments, please do feel free to reach out to us. We can be reached at Uncovered Podcast at yahoo.com. We're also available on Facebook, where you can find us at Uncovered Vintage Fashion Magazine Review. We also have a Twitter page, which is at Uncovered VFMR, and Instagram at Uncovered underscore VFMR. And lastly, we're always thrilled to hear from you, so please feel free to reach out. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to the next time. See you soon. Thank you for listening to Uncovered Vintage Fashion Magazine Review Podcast. Uncovered was produced by Morley Shulman, with music by David Renda, and logo design by Alan Lipman. So remember, if you liked Uncovered, be sure to tell two friends about it. And I'll tell two friends. And, and so, so on, on, and so on, and so on. And so on.